primeiras horas da manhã. À esquerda está a passarela de inspiração náutica com tábuas estilo convés e torres tipo mastros. À direita está a curva do rio que se volta para o leste depois da ponte Waterloo, em direção ao dono de Catedral St. Paul. Ela sente o sol começar a se erguer. No ar, ainda uma brisa antes de a cidade ficar entupida de calor e fumaça. Uma vilanista toca alguma coisa devidamente inspiradora mais adiante no passeio. A peça de Ama, a última amazona do reino de Daoné, estreia no Teatro Nacional essa noite. Chegou um ponto em que os habitantes de Marte não podiam mais negar o aquecimento do seu planeta ou a escala da destruição que estava por vir. Em uma última tentativa desesperada de preservar sua civilização, eles construíram vastos canais conectando os polos do planeta à grande extensão de terra arrasada que cobriu o resto da superfície. O degelo anual das camadas de gelo polares produziria a água necessária para o cultivo de alimentos suficiente para a sobrevivência de pelo menos mais uma geração. Educação indígena A educação na aldeia indígena começa desde a primeira idade. Não segue os padrões de sala de aula. É um aprender sem pressa na solidariedade. Aprende que a agitação da formiga e o canto do sapo indicam que a chuva vem aí. Aprende a apreciar desde pequeno um bom peixe assado com vinho de açaí. Aprende que na arte de pescar, só se pesca o que vai precisar. E a calma é importante para a flecha no peixe acertar. Aprende com os mais velhos nossa memória viva, com os espíritos conversar e deles a permissão receber para na mata entrar. Eu não tinha porra nenhuma para fazer lá. Quer dizer... Por que será que mora com a minha ex-namorada, sua nova namorada e a ex-namorada dela? Como é que alguém pode se sentir bem assim? Eu poderia estar escrevendo essa história de uma cela de cadeia. Engraçado, né? Ted e Alice antes da minha partida disseram Nada é tão ruim que não possa piorar ele. Eu não sabia mais o que fazer. Peguei um voo sim, eu fiz isso. Pra Portland. E a Julia e a Cris me buscaram no aeroporto. Eu estava muito doidona no avião. Encontrei ela ali, hoje de manhã, de barriga para cima. Revelou Dona Elodia, indicando um ponto na praia onde se juntava o lixo que o mar trazia ou desenterrava. Troncos, sacolas plásticas, garrafas. Envenenada? Acho que sim. O que fizeram com ela? Enterraram? 
Dona Elodia fez que sim com a cabeça e disse, meus netos, lá em cima no cemitério? Não, aqui mesmo na praia. Muitos cães do povoado morriam envenenados. Havia quem dissesse que eram mortos de propósito, mas Damares não podia acreditar que existissem pessoas capazes de fazer algo assim e achava que os cachorros comiam por engano as iscas com veneno deixadas para os ratos. Ou comiam os ratos, que por estarem envenenados eram caçados com facilidade. Sinto muito, disse Damares. O imenso moedor está triturando animais mortos recolhidos nas estradas. Tanto o barulho do motor quanto dos ossos sendo esmagados ricocheteiam nas paredes altas do galpão. A mistura de som e fedor enfurece os sentidos. Edgar Wilson deixa o carrinho no lugar delimitado por um retângulo pintado no chão e sobe os degraus de uma escadinha de alumínio que dá acesso à caçamba do moedor de onde é possível ver o lado de dentro. Consegue ver o que é? Grita um funcionário afastando o protetor auditivo. Não estou vendo nada, grita de volta Edgar Wilson. Desde cedo está assim, agarrando. Mas não estou vendo nada. Sobre o autoritarismo brasileiro, Lilia Moritz Schwartz, demorei aqui a... <risos> Escravidão e racismo. No Brasil, o sistema escravocrata transformou-se num modelo tão enraizado que acabou se convertendo numa linguagem com graves consequências. Graçou por aqui, do século XVI ao XIX, uma escandalosa injustiça amparada pela artimanha da legalidade. Como não havia nada em nossa legislação que vetasse ou regulasse tal sistema, ele se espraiou por todo o país, entrando firme nos costumes da terra. Imperou no nosso território uma grande bastardia jurídica, a total falta de direitos de alguns ante a imensa concentração de poderes nas mãos de outros. Fim. Se alguém for um espírito guardião, mandado pela primeira vez para habitar um hospedeiro que veio ao mundo em Umoniá, uma cidade na terra dos grandes pais, a primeira coisa a surpreender o espírito seria a imensidão da terra. Quando o espírito guardião desce, com o corpo reencarnado do novo hospedeiro em direção à terra, o que se revela ao olho é assombroso. Subitamente, como se alguma cortina primordial fosse aberta, estamos expostos a uma extensão de vegetação verde e luxuriante. Quando retirei a faca da mala de roupas, embrulhada em um pedaço de tecido antigo e encardido, com nóduas escuras e um nó no meio, tinha pouco mais de sete anos. Minha irmã, Belonísia, que estava comigo, era mais nova há um ano. Pouco antes daquele evento, estávamos no terreiro da casa antiga, brincando com bonecas feitas de espiga de milho, colhidas na semana anterior. Aproveitávamos as palhas que já amarelavam para vestir feito roupas nos sabugos. Falávamos que as bonecas eram as nossas filhas, filhas de Bibiana e Belonísia.
um apartamento em urano. Em termos biológicos, afirmar que são necessários um homem e uma mulher para levar a cabo um processo de reprodução sexual é tão ridículo quanto eram, em outros tempos, as afirmações de que a reprodução só aconteceria entre dois corpos que partilhassem a mesma religião, o mesmo sangue, a mesma cor de pele ou o mesmo status social. Da mesma maneira que, enquanto estamos presos, não cremos na vida livre, que não podemos esquecer. Uma vez soltos, esquecemos a coerência interna da vida na prisão de cuja realidade, no entanto, não duvidamos. Hoje sei que saí, venho saindo, da prisão como quem sai de um sonho. Ao passo que, enquanto preso, eu julgava que Santo Amaro, o solar da fossa e a TV Record é que tinham sido um sonho do qual não era possível sair. Às vezes, você fazia um pensamento e morava nele, afastava-se. Construía uma casa assim, longínqua, dentro de mim. Era esse o seu modo de lidar com as coisas. Hoje, prefiro pensar que você partiu para regressar a mim. E não queria apenas a sua ausência como legado. Eu queria um tipo de presença. Ainda que dolorida e triste. E apesar de tudo, nesta casa, nesse apartamento, você será sempre o corpo que não vai parar de morrer. Será sempre o pai que se recusa a partir. Quando o menino tinha quatro anos, ele perguntou ao pai, por que as pessoas precisavam dormir? O pai respondeu, para que Deus conseguisse desfuder tudo que eles fuderam. Quando o menino tinha doze, ele perguntou à mãe, por que o pai tinha ido embora de casa? A mãe disse, para poder fuder com tudo que passar pela frente. Quando o menino tinha treze, ele quis saber por que o pai tinha voltado para casa. A mãe respondeu, eu tenho 41, eu não estou afim de ficar procurando alguém para fuder. Aos 14, quando os palavrões pareciam jorrar da boca dos amigos feito água num cano furado, a palavra foda não exercia nenhum fascínio sobre o garoto. Nenhum. Nenhum pingo. Firme, não suporto o chão de seus fundamentos. Tô de saco cheio de chamar tua imprudência de lei. Cada noite conto meus irmãos. E pela manhã, quando alguns não sobrevivem para serem contados, conto as covas que deixaram. Estendo a mão ao povo preto e toco apenas o ar. Seu truque de mestre, América. Ora ele respira, ora não. Abra cadáver, macumba para turista, feitiço que alega não praticar. Dá logo uma pistola ao meu primo para fazer o trampo por vocês? Eu tentei, gente branca. Tentei, branquelos, mas passaram o funeral do meu mano fazendo planos para um cafezinho, falando alto demais ao lado de seus ossos.
ama. Está andando pelo passeio do canal que divide a cidade. Algumas barcaças navegando lentamente nas primeiras horas da manhã. À esquerda está a passarela de inspiração náutica com tábuas estilo convés e torres tipo mastros. À direita está a curva do rio que se volta para o leste depois da ponte Waterloo, em direção ao dono de Catedral St. Paul. Ela sente o sol começar a se erguer. No ar, ainda uma brisa antes de a cidade ficar entupida de calor e fumaça. Uma vilanista toca alguma coisa devidamente inspiradora mais adiante no passeio. A peça de Ama, a última Amazona do Reino de Daoné, estreia no Teatro Nacional essa noite. Chegou um ponto em que os habitantes de Marte não podiam mais negar o aquecimento do seu planeta ou a escala da destruição que estava por vir. Em uma última tentativa desesperada de preservar sua civilização, eles construíram vastos canais conectando os polos do planeta à grande extensão de terra arrasada que cobriu o resto da superfície. O degelo anual das camadas de gelo polares produziria a água necessária para o cultivo de alimentos suficiente para a sobrevivência de pelo menos mais uma geração. Educação indígena A educação na aldeia indígena começa desde a primeira idade. Não segue os padrões de sala de aula. É um aprender sem pressa na solidariedade. Aprende que a agitação da formiga e o canto do sapo indicam que a chuva vem aí. Aprende a apreciar desde pequeno um bom peixe assado com vinho de açaí. Aprende que na arte de pescar, só se pesca o que vai precisar. E a calma é importante para a flecha no peixe acertar. Aprende com os mais velhos nossa memória viva, com os espíritos conversar e deles a permissão receber para na mata entrar. Eu não tinha porra nenhuma para fazer lá. Quer dizer... Por que será que mora com a minha ex-namorada, sua nova namorada e a ex-namorada dela? Como é que alguém pode se sentir bem assim? Eu poderia estar escrevendo essa história de uma cela de cadeia. Engraçado, né? Ted e Alice antes da minha partida disseram Nada é tão ruim que não possa piorar ele. Eu não sabia mais o que fazer. Peguei um voo sim, eu fiz isso. Pra Portland. E a Julie e a Chris me buscaram no aeroporto. Eu estava muito doidona no avião. Encontrei ela ali, hoje de manhã, de barriga para cima. Revelou Dona Elodia, indicando um ponto na praia onde se juntava o lixo que o mar trazia ou desenterrava. Troncos, sacolas plásticas, 
garrafas. Envenenada? Acho que sim. O que fizeram com ela? Enterraram? Dona Elodia fez que sim com a cabeça e disse, meus netos, lá em cima, no cemitério? Não, aqui mesmo, na praia. Muitos cães do povoado morriam envenenados. Havia quem dissesse que eram mortos de propósito, mas Damares não podia acreditar que existissem pessoas capazes de fazer algo assim e achava que os cachorros comiam por engano as iscas com veneno deixadas para os ratos. Ou comiam os ratos, que por estarem envenenados eram caçados com facilidade. Sinto muito, disse Damares. O imenso moedor está triturando animais mortos recolhidos nas estradas. Tanto o barulho do motor quanto dos ossos sendo esmagados ricocheteiam nas paredes altas do galpão. A mistura de som e fedor enfurece os sentidos. Edgar Wilson deixa o carrinho no lugar delimitado por um retângulo pintado no chão e sobe os degraus de uma escadinha de alumínio que dá acesso à caçamba do moedor de onde é possível ver o lado de dentro. Consegue ver o que é? Grita um funcionário afastando o protetor auditivo. Não estou vendo nada, grita de volta Edgar Wilson. Desde cedo está assim, agarrando, mas não estou vendo nada. Sobre o autoritarismo brasileiro. Lilia Moritz Schwarz. Demorei aqui a. <risos> Escravidão e racismo. No Brasil, o sistema escravocrata transformou-se no modelo. Eu me chamo Daniele. My name is Daniele. Uh, I'm uh, from a Quilombo community, the Campinho da Independência Maroon community here, 13 kilometers from the historic center. The Campinho da Independência was three, founded by three women, Gia Marcelina, Luisa, and another. There were several ranches. The 
workforce, as I call it, uh, the slaves in the entered into decadence when there was a single crop agriculture, the land gets weak and exhausted. The only connection that the ranchers had was with the economy, the slave economy. They abandoned the territory. They could not uh, sell their slaves anymore. And the three women they occupied, and they said, that's great. They've left, the ranchers have left. Let's set up our community, which was called Sertão da Independência, the maroon community of former slaves descending from these three women. And we're all descendants of these three. We're 600 members now in the maroon community. We're in the seventh living generation of these three women. And there was a long struggle in the 1970s. The Rio Santos Highway crossed our territory. People were living in peace with their subsistence crops and fishing. And when the 70s came, the Rio Santos Highway crossed our land with real estate speculation and it changed our way of life. The elders lived peacefully and they had to wage a struggle that lasted almost 30 years to be able to get the deeds. We didn't have any documents that proved that the land belonged to us. On March 21, 1989, we received, we we're the first in the state of Rio de Janeiro, the first maroon community with a collective deed. It's a collective deed for the community. There's one deed for the 287 hectares of land. So we can't sell the land, we can't lease the land, we can't donate the land either, but we can live there as a community. What the attorneys for the land structure we have a fair in Parachi. It's extremely important working with this issue in the schools, the history. We, it's a criticism, but with a, a positive criticism, we want to help to build. We've created the flip, Black Flip. Last year, it was the first edition of Black Flip. It was a dream that we've had for years where we take a racial perspective on flip, bringing our people together and lending visibility for the intellectuals, for the black people. So Black Flip happens in parallel to the main edition of Flip. I think it's an opportunity as well for people living from Flip to actually learn about the story told by the owners of the story, the people who lived it. Ministry of Tourism and the Casa Azul Association now present the 18th Flip, the Parachi International Literary Festival, benefiting from a federal tax incentives law, Vale Mais Cultura, with official sponsorship by Itaú Bank, with support from the Parachi Municipal Government, Piero Neto Attorneys, and you all. It's organized by Casa Azul Association, the Special Secretariat for Culture under the Ministry of Tourism of the Brazilian Federal Government. This roundtable is live and questions for the authors can be sent in throughout the broadcast through the chat box on YouTube. At the end of the talk, some of the questions will be addressed to the guest speakers. We wish you all a wonderful flip. Good afternoon. My name is Flavia Lima. I'm a journalist and the ombud, ombudsman for the uh, for de São Paulo, welcome one and all to the sixth roundtable called On Authoritarianism. It's an honor to be part of the FLIP with Flavia Rios, who is a professor at the Federal University Fluminense in Niterói with this research groups. He better an Afro Sebrapsis co-author of Lele Gonçalves and co-organizers of the books, Black Books in Brazilian Cities and Afro-Latin American Feminism, published just this year. I wish to introduce our guest 
professor, fourth professor at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Sao Paulo, visiting professor of, at Princeton and the cur joint curator for history at the Sao Paulo Museum of Modern Art, amongst other books. Lilian is the author of uh, The Spectacle of the Races, The Emperor's Beard, and on Brazilian authoritarianism, which is the focus of our discussion this afternoon. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And everyone in your book, there, Lilian, there's several different relevant topics for politics, Brazilian politics and society, like the issue of the racial issues, slavery and inequalities, but also uh, modernism, uh, pe uh, patrimonialism, good markers for understanding our authoritarianism. Your book was launched in 2019. What's the quality of what you discussed two years later and what has been reshaped in your understanding in the past two years? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the two Flavias. Thank you to Flip for this invitation again. It's a huge honor to be here with you all. Great, Flavia, the book was launched in May 2019. The book was considered perhaps the first print book which reacted to the government that had been elected in 2018, Jair Bolsonaro's administration. The book, I think, doesn't I'm certain that it doesn't raise two major phenomena from 2020, the pandemic, plus the racial issue in Brazil. The pandemic, however, confirms perhaps some of the premises of the book. We know that the pandemic entered Brazil as if it were a disease, a democratic disease, supposedly, and very quickly it proved that it was not democratic at all. It could have been democratic in transmission. It was not democratic in its the number of deaths, and it affected particularly the poor populations. And within the poor populations, especially the Black population in Brazil, a pandemic doesn't do anything itself, but it unveils some of, and lays bare some of Brazil's characteristics. In this case, the pandemic laid bare the inequality and with inequality, the racial element as if it were an additional disadvantage in our inequality. The another element precisely that appeared in 2020, I think is also covered in the book, which is namely the racial issue. When the book was launched, it received, I would say it was well received, very positive reception, but one magazine said that I was inventing the myth of the racial conflict in Brazil. I think it was clear in 2020 and that I wasn't any, inventing anything. The book, the book treats a number of elements, but it begins and ends with the racial issue, Flavia, because I believe that this is the main contradiction of the Brazilian agenda, a contradiction in, with an imprint in the past, but it's also inscribed in the press, the last element, I believe, perhaps already at that time, could have been seen already at that time, but I should have explored further the issue of ch Protestant churches and evangelical churches, which were already a strong phenomenon in Brazilian authoritarianism. So the game of the play was focused on the idea that the present is full of the past. I ended up not returning to this issue itself. Okay, thank you, Lily. Uh, Flavio, would you like to comment on that? Yes, I want to comment. Thank you very much. I begin by thanking Flip for the invitation and Flavia Lima's partnership with Lillian Schwartz for this invitation as well, and this possibility to engage in dialogue with your book. Lillian, you just spoke about a scenario in which you write a book in the post election period. You published it in the post election period. If I were to ask you, who was your target audience? Who would you like to reach? I would imagine that you would say every Brazilian, all Brazilians, it's a book, it's quite accessible with a, accessible arguments, etc. But in 20, page 25, you appear to address you, a specific audience. You talk about people and that have witnessed surprise them, authoritarian expressions. You talk specifically about the one who is in the bleachers watching, they're in the bleachers, uh, watching the growth of a politics of hate. So you address your work to an audience. You want to engage in dialogue directly with a certain profile. Is that correct or not? 
Okay, Flavia, thanks. That's a great question. Exactly. This is a book which was commissioned. I'm going to talk about the backstage of the book. The book was commissioned by Compañía das Letras, my publishing house. If it's commissioned, it sounds a lot easier. They said, just use your files, everything that you've written on Instagram, and you have your book ready-made. That's not how it played out. And when we actually have to uh, have a book ready to print, you have to do a lot of research. I entered into areas that are not part of my specialization. So you had to take great care in narrating this story, especially in a story, historiography in such a short time. You're a sociologist, Flavia. I'm here with the two Flavias. So it's gonna be complicated to make sure I have the, talking to the right. Flavia is an ombudsman in the uh, Fode de São Paulo. Talking about the present time, I'm an anthropologist. I, teach in the anthropology. I've always been on the third bank of the river. I'm an historian amongst anthropologists and the historians prefer to analyze processes that end social processes that are demarcated because you can tie them together more consistently. And this is perhaps a disadvantage to the book, but the advantage of the book is to take the temperature of the time. I told Flavia Lima that one of the issues, one of the provocations of this book was to say that the present is full of the past. The other provocation was to say that those who had the, were in the bleachers watching and had reacted with great alarm and surprise to such a retrograde government. I would like to, I don't think it, it's a conserv conservative government. I'd like to say that the temperature of democracy, the difference make, does a lot of good. I have problems with, with backward looking governments who want to backstep. So what was my issue? It was to say that we have always been authoritarian in Brazil. There's no surprise whatsoever with the Bolsonaro government. So this book it is addressed to a broader audience. I know that the book has uh, sold very quickly. So I know that I have a younger audience that it's readership as well. And this readership who embarked on the campaign of Bolsonaro in Jair Bolsonaro's election as if he were something that he tried to pose as, as if he were one, a new kind of politician that never fooled me. He was always part of the old politics. He'd been a, a federal congressman for 28 years, but he almost introduced zero bills. They were more connected to the military issues. The only bills that he presented and submitted in Congress, this idea that he, his campaign representing uh, a, uh, a no to traditional politics. That was a mistake. It was. Uh, it is a message for these people who, in some sense, uh, embarked on this campaign and wagered on what was uh, posed as a new kind of Brazil, a new kind of history, but it was an extremely old story that we're all too familiar with. Okay, Lydia, in your book, you say that authoritarian projects have the capacity to recreate the past and obscure the role of populations who lived and created other histories, not only the European history and colonial history. How do you identify these aspects as a political project for the current government administration? And the way you describe it, this project is part of a tradition, a Brazilian tradition. Do you see anything new in this government and what would it be in that sense? Okay, fine. One by one, I think I think that the book is traversed by the issue of historical narrative, the various different historical narratives, and especially the history of memory. Normally, we use history and memory as synonyms. It's possible to say that history and memory are different perspectives on knowledge of the past, but sometimes history uh, uh, destroys memory because the memory is much more is traversed by the issue of subjectivity by the perception, individual perception, while history, it has a commitment to proof, documental proof, it's a science. Science, therefore it airs and it airs and gets right. Sometimes the book, book begins with the 1944. It was, they said concerning the wrote of the title was how to write the history of Brazil. It could have been altered and how to invent a history, a history for Brazil. and. It was a foreigner who won this contest, a foreign naturalist, Volmarsius, Volmarsius. And his premise, he built a historical 
perspective on the idea of miscegenation. He didn't invent this narrative. It already existed, but the premise of this narrative has a very long, it lasted for a very long. What was the idea of the existence of Rio Branco, a long river and a black river, a shorter river, and all of them flowed into Rio Branco. So the idea of miscegenation in an ideology of classification, Lelia Gonzalez would say this idea that you have a mixture, maintenance, of difference and hierarchy. This is the model that's widely used by the Bolsonaro government. Every political move moment creates new narratives and the Bolsonaro government has this vision, which is a traditional vision of nostalgia of the past, uh, well orderly past, everything is hierarchical and very prim and proper in this view of a Brazil that's whiter Suffice it to see that the, uh, the beloved fatherland, the presence, there are five different white and blonde children. In other words, it's an advertisement. It's a very traditional model and it's a very traditional model of practicing politics. If I were the, oh, and Weber, who's a sociologist, Weber uh, represents, it's a charismatic government. In other words, which is a kind of populist government around the person who separates himself from the others. That's why Bolsonaro now, it's been a year, correct me if I'm wrong, he's governing without a party already. So it's a typical charismatic government. It's an authoritarian government because his point of departure is curtailing, curtailing or repressing and uses a lot the issue of disinformation and misinformation and launches and uses censorship. One of his first acts was censorship. And in addition to the use, I can talk about other characteristics. Another element which is important for us to highlight is that he, he comes in the midst of a movement, a more global movement, an international movement. We're talking about the growth in 2017, 2018 of these more authoritarian governments, all of the males, of course, who rule in a very manly, so to speak, uh, way. They don't talk to the people and they're populist in this sense as well. They listen, short phrases and easy for people to assimilate. What is new now in Brazil and abroad is the fact that these people are governed or these governments are populist governments, authoritarian governments, technocratic governments. In other words, they've succeeded in electing themselves based on the social networks. This is a new, uh, it's very uh, strong characteristics and new in the world. It's very new as well in Brazil. Another novelty is that it's the first time that the evangelical power has uh, reached power, has taken power at the maximum level of the executive branch. We cannot forget that Jair Bolsonaro gave his first speech on his networks on that he talked to the nation and he made his first speech with a Bible sitting next to him on the table. The idea that the Republic is a lay public Republic. He begins to challenge this idea of a lay uh, public, uh, uh, non-denominational. Lillian, you just talked about Jair Bolsonaro, but the word and the term, the name of the person doesn't appear in the book. So Jair Bolsonaro, is there all the time as a phantom. And I like to use the word phantom, which you use a lot to refer to the issues which are all, always persist. And focusing on this dialogue with what Flavia mentioned about tradition, uh, the problems, Brazilian problems, and in uh, thinking you as an anthropologist deal with the issue of the myth. And we have a president who was uh, proposed as it's just not just right-wing populism, but it's a populism with this element of, of a, a messiah, a myth. So I'd like you to expound on this idea of myth in Brazil, both from the point of view of the national myths. We're thinking about racial democracy in this discussion that you mentioned of the three rivers. Some of them are uh, bigger rivers than others. Some of them are much more powerful than others and have a, and a mythical personality differentiating these national imaginations from one who personifies the myth is are there different conceptual differences? What are the implications of this? Okay, in the book, I did this intentionally, Flavia. I thought to myself, 
I believe that Jair Bolsonaro is a symptom of our authoritarianism. I was what I was saying to Flavia Lima. It doesn't, he's not the only element to explain. In other words, the return of authoritarianism, it's not a return. It was always there, somewhat silent, rather in the shadows. Uh, since the 1988 constitution, we don't have full democracy, but let's say let's, that we had government administrations with more democratic profiles, but he was always there. Otherwise we wouldn't understand his election in 19 or 2018. If we buy into the package, like he's unique and charismatic and everything that depends exclusively on him, this in the book, he's a symptom and he only appears in the chapter then uh, chapter on authoritarianism when I talk about the relatives and uh, the Bolsonaro familia lives off this uh, public service in this place. They're very well separated amongst the older people, uh, city councilman, uh, state congressman, uh, national congressman, and the president. So this is my purpose of not talking about directly about Jair Bolsonaro, as I just have said now. The issue, the issue that you raise and very properly, I think we're talking about different kind of myths. We can say that the myth of racial democracy in Brazil is a myth in the Marxist sense of a lie because it is an ideology of uh, denial uh, where you deny to be able to at the same time affirm and refuse and deny it's a kind of ideology therefore which hides what does it hide hides conflicts it hides subordination it hides the processes of invisibility so in this sense it is a kind of ideology of racial democracy in the marxist sense it is a lie nevertheless as a anthropologist i think good myths are the ones which act in a kind of spiral and which always tell the truth in some way, or they say the truth about what? About the major contradictions, the contradictions, insoluble contradictions of a society. As I said at the beginning of my answer to Flavia Lima, the racial issue in Brazil is the main contradiction of Brazilian society. Therefore, it will continue to produce the myths. In other words, uh, uh, the whitening, racial democracy, all these myths. In a word, these are the images the Brazilians, these narratives that Brazilians build, construct for themselves to protect themselves in a way. This idea that Brazilians, Brazil is a country that is averse to conflict. We're all very balanced and calm with a uh, paradise and God is Brazilian even. Since that doesn't really work, we have a myth, comments of lies, but also there's a component of truth to such myths as well. But Jair Bolsonaro, who was called a myth even, it was his nickname, and his son was called the little myth. It's very problematic and the diminutive because in a republic, citizenship is a kind of uh, franchise of democracy. It's open to everyone. You'd have a contract for to whom you delegate your vote. Democracy is affirmed based on the votes and the institutions and the political parties, but you don't forego. It's not that you uh, forego this place in politics. On the contrary, the true and veritable democracy is based on uh, eternal surveillance. And when you elect someone who part of his electorate is considered a myth, we have returned also to a traditional contradiction of politics in Brazil, a convention. I always say when I was studying Weber in high school that Brazilians are used to having the head of the executive party, the great fathers, the paternal figures, father figures. This is a problem. I always tell the story when I was finishing the research for uh, Pedro Segundo, I looked at the sacristy and there was the the trilogy uh, from Bahia, which was Getúlio de Vargas, Pedro II, and Antonio Carlos Magalhães, the governor, by no coincidence, they were called the little, dear little father, this contradiction of assigning to the executive branch a separate position, different and distinct from the rest of men is a problem for Brazilian politics. It's a problem for our modernity. It's a problem for our republic because you don't have a contract with myths. You don't sign a contract. You don't engage in dialogue. You don't debate with them. You accept whatever they say. You confirm their, it's it's a very problematic vision to be accepted with uh, the president of a republic as such. Well, uh, Lily, I would like to talk to you a little bit about 
uh, our public security policies, our police force. Today, we had yet another tragic, violent episode of two children killed in Brazil. And uh, so I would like to, in your book, you talk about uh, this connection that was historically consolidated in Brazil between repressing forth and certain local elites producing a police that, according to you, would treat citizens in a different way. And my question is, why uh, governments that call themselves democratic were so uh, shy or shied away from changing this uh, very uh, enrooted policy? Well, it belongs, uh, it's under the president of the republic to do, deal with three things, health, education, and security. Jair Bolsonaro, in part of his campaign, we can't see he got it wrong. He was talking directly uh, about security in Brazil. So I just disagree how, uh, what were the choices he made. But um, security issues, violent is violence issues, are something that is uh, un unheard of in Brazil. The numbers of violence in Brazil are unprecedented. We, it's like, you know, a, a 707 uh, Boeing falling every day. So it's, uh, uh, these are epidemic numbers and they are, they're considered epidemic by the World Health Organization. And these numbers, these figures have a great reflection from our colonial stories with a local uh, strong uh, elite. Uh, there's this, there is this uh, link between police forces and our elite. Since uh, enslavement period in uh, Brazil, black people could be arrested because they were suspected to be enslaved. So why were you uh, um, in, in prison because of that? This was in the mid 19th century onwards when you already have a population of a free uh, black population. So in the 19th century, the condition as a person, as a black person is never guaranteed to you. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I have the two fathers here to talk about this, but we know that all uh, black mothers, and I've heard this from many mothers, that when their children leave home to go to work or school or what have you, you have to talk to them how to behave, how they should behave, how to react, because you already have this assumption that, uh, you know, you have the repression, you have the police force, and a certain target, and the target is or are the black bodies. And that they uh, will, of course, catch more black people than white, and they will suffer greater violence. And, um, and the examples you were giving now just now, there's also this issue, there is something new in all this. It's not that new, but still, you also talked about this in an article you wrote, it has to do with the militia forces. We have a president now and uh, that, uh, well, is a president who seems to be very close to the militia forces. I guess you wrote this article saying we have to talk about the militia or something like that, because we really do have to talk about the militia forces. This is a topic that can't be, you know, tackled just, you know, every other day. This is something that, for instance, that would happen today with have to Beto Freitas uh, or with Agatha or Marielle, and still we want to know who killed Marielle Franco. We still don't know. So. This association between different powers, be it the colonial powers, the imperial powers, and now the Republican powers with the uh, repression forces, police forces, this is a chronic issue in Brazil. And the governments, as you've said, do not confront this issue. And I would say even more, it is contradictory that Jair Bolsonaro is uh, also was elected in the name of security. So you see, this is a great misunderstanding. We sometimes, you know, blur away all this line, all this frontier of a president with uh, the militias, especially the militia in Rio de Janeiro, militia that uh, can be found all over Brazil. But this is a chronic issue. This is an urgent uh, issue. And the governments decide not to work on it because it's not something that is very popular. Like the uh, pandemic isn't popular. You can see, you know, here in Sao Paulo, where I live, where I guess you live too, uh, the second round, the control measures of what will be the uh, second wave of uh, COVID-19 were only uh, taken after uh, the election day. So we have this 
and systematic political power or game in Brazil. This, this kind of topic, you know, that does not give you votes, that is unpleasant, that will tackle the whole infrastructure is always delayed and it's always delayed in our uh, media too. Flavio Rios, please. Yes, uh, regarding this topic um, that Flavio was just referring to, regarding the elites, uh, Lily, you, uh, throughout your book, and I uh, even talked about that, I counted the number of times you use the term elite to talk, of course, about these uh, five centuries, more than five centuries of our country's history. Of course, the word elite has to be, of course, repeated exhaustively uh, in your book. And actually, the word people, you see the word people more than the word elite. And it's interesting to note because people is always seen in your text in a different way. So if in the beginning you had the whole story of inventing a, po a people, inventing a nation, who are we talking about? And you have to have a homogeneous Europeans, a homogeneous native, you have to bring all these people together to create one single nation, one single people. And then this idea of povo, people, will now have a new setting in your text, referring to those who will give voice to the greater dimensions of the sentences, the statements that might open some kind of understanding to that society. So this is a uh, people talking uh, in terms of uh, when the elites are now going around the houses to, to, to take them away from them. And these are um, situations that you see a reaction from the people. But the people in your text is reactive with these creative statements that will truly state, you know, I understand what is going on. But in a certain way, it is also a, 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 a people that are, are animals, someone that are just sitting and following. And the elites are the, another thing in your book. And maybe the best verb is the verb to have. It is to have control, to have power, to have everything. And maybe the people didn't have this power. So this is something you always refer to in your text. And the word classes, social classes, it's something almost absent in your text. And this is a book that will, you know, follow more than 500 years of history. So I concluded, and I cannot, I have to make this play of words. Of course, your text is full of play of words. Would be, is Brazil a country that is classless or classes? Because uh, there's this absence of the possibility of interpreting your understanding, your uh, text in terms of this intermediary classes and this polarization between classes and elites. Well, the elite was something. But wait, let me let me go back. This is a book that I wrote after I wrote with Luisa Stalin's Brazil: A Biography. This other book. So, this is more of an essay type of book. Brazil: uh, A Biography was more committed with a historical narrative or facts, and also in a timeline. This is a book that does not have this timeline in mind. It, it does actually an inversion of all this. The topics are the ones that will actually tie in to one another that will create this uh, timeline even. And I also wrote it after having published A Bahia de Triste Visionário. And this book is mirrored in terms of the difficulty uh, I had in, in writing this book. And Lima Barreto, Triste Visionário, died at 41 because of racism. He was killed by racism. But I really like the way you, you, you um, ask this question. The elite word, in the more traditional poetry, talk about elite in a, uh, in, in a singular. So, uh, so it's the elite. When I try to refer to elites, plural, these are different projects. The uh, Sao Paulo elite, the... Pernambuco state elite in the 16th, 16th century, and they're going to talk about the uh, elites of Rio de Janeiro in the 21st century. So this whole idea of elites, plural, is recent because we used to refer to elite as one single uh, elite. And now following your question, uh, what the word people, povo in Portuguese, we are different peoples. I always have said, and more so, I am very pessimistic uh, in retail, but I'm, I'm optimistic in general. So, but you really were able to, you know, put your finger on this. You know, I have this 
belief, not in the religious sense, but I have this belief that uh, like Gilberto Gil, you know, I'm, I always have a belief and I will continue with belief as uh, Gilberto Gil music normally says in its lyrics. So uh, I have, I believe in the civic space, a place where you can argument, debate, where you can find a social pact. And I guess this is how we will leave behind our recent history. In different moments of Brazilian history, I say, you know, Brazilian people lost themselves and then found themselves. I always am reminded by this episode uh, during the Getúlio Vargas mandate, when the people went to the streets, we still had a military dictatorship, but we did delay a little bit military dictatorship in, in the country. And the example you refer to, the PR, uh, you know, put yourself in the streets, PR, PR in a Brazilian acronym. So when Don Juan, the government of Don Juan, the uh, Portuguese king who came to Brazil, and of course the elite, the nobles were, you know, taking the best, um, the best homes in Rio de Janeiro and all the noble people who were coming with them, they would write PR. PR is put yourself in the street. And they want to say propriedade real, this is royal property. And the uh, people would just make a joke of it, saying PR stood for ponha-se na rua, put yourself in the street. But the whole idea is the popular resistance. When we talk about enslavement, I try not to victimize, even though we do have, of course, to talk about the victimization. But I'd like to talk about, you know, the resistance, the Quilombos or Maroon communities. This is what I'm interested in talking about. And also resistance during the Republic, instead of just talking about, you know, how we became orphans. I'd like to talk about how we associated, how we created communities, how we developed newspapers. And it's interesting the way you raised this question to me, because I work at the Sao Paulo University, USP, in the uh, social markers of differences. It's called NUMAS, a good name, I like it, NUMAS. And in this uh, social uh, differences uh, markers, we work with the concept of intersectionality. This is a concept, of course, that you, Flavia Hughes, work with too. So we talk about social markers as uh, races, gender, region, generation, religion, and social class. I know as a sociologist is not so orthodox in an approach, but social classes will be included in the book as one of the social markers of the differences. It is an anthropological point of view because I'm more interested in Flavia in trying to do or find this intersectionality. I know this is not what you work with, but the whole idea of that social class, the concept of social class would solve any issue as a, as a professor, as a student. It was like if you spoke uh, the French or, or German, you know, you can always uh, close your class by saying some kind of German uh, proverb and no one will be able to discuss that with you. And when you talk about social class, you were, you know, that's when you would win the argument. But social class is not as good to explain as uh, race or gender or generation. So you see it less, but it's not that it doesn't exist. It is one additional social difference marker. Flavia, may, may, may I just comment here uh, one thing that Lily uh, said? It has to you know, when she talks about uh, the, her text being more of an essay, there is this proposal. And then, Lily, looking to the set of your work, uh, your production, this book has to, seems to have a different place, a different space. And this is my impression. I don't know if you agree with me. You said that you open your book, actually, and maybe opening this dialogue with uh, this tradition of the Brazilian essay history. It's a great tradition of Brazilian literature to have essayist, not only writing an essay to find this longer story, the uh, difficulties of Brazil, all the issues, state, nation, people, elites, so forth and so on, bureaucracy. So, and then you talk about the specificities. What are the specificities of Brazil? And this, of course, the great essayists always say, what is the specificity of the Brazilian people? And you bring it, you know, our specificity, such as Brazil is also greater, and this is one of our features of our tradition. It is greater in terms of territory, in terms of a, a continental sized country, a greater inflow of enslaved Africans. It is a monarchy as an island, you know, surrounded by republics, and you have one single language, this idea of unity. So it's big, it's unique, it's specific. And this is the pure tradition of so Brazilian social 
thought. And this is where you work in. So my question, when are you able to, you know, put this kind of thought away from you, keep it at arm's length, because you're always criticizing, creating tension. So why start a book and also bring a work thinking about Brazilian authoritarianism? Isn't, again, um, reviewing the pro problem from a national singularity or uniqueness uh, Good question. point of view? I think that... I guess let me take a shot at that. No, I work. Uh, I work with Flavia, Flavia Rios, and myself. Lima. You're Flavia, Flavia Lima, Lima. Also, she's always, always invited to. Welcome, but we're we part, part of an association, of an association called, called the Association of Social Science Research of, uh, ANPOCS. ANPOCS is the acronym. It sounds like soap, but it's not. It's, laundry uh, detergent, but the and acronym is box. for social scientists. I'm part of a group in ANPOX, the association. It's a, it's it's a it long-lasting association. Called it's called Brazilian, Brazilian Social, social thought. Uh, thinking. thought. Something that One I noticed is that the I issue of authoritarianism is, that, uh, is covered that by is this tradition of Brazilian of the social Brazilian, thinking, but not uh, so much. Thinking. It's extremely but important to think uh, of the parody of Father Vieira and the bird, the and bird the sees his shadow. There's, there's only a bird when there's a shadow. When there's a shadow. It's interesting and in the search for peculiarity, if we consider specificity, Gilberto Freire, Caio Prado Júnior, Sérgio Buarque de Holanda, our peculiarity is in a kind of sociability averse to so here authoritarianism. It's, really an, uh, it's not averse to authoritarianism. To There's only this representation of a country, a giant country. It speaks Portuguese, a country, a country, 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 Portuguese -speaking uh, country, a country that uh, wishes poses as to harmonious be a great peace, and pacific, keeping but and peaceful they don't and everything. exist if you have it, a shadow, and the shadow is, is the authoritarianism. Shadow of authoritarianism. I believe that uh, in my, my books, books in general, in general I always am captivated uh, captive to or, or issues, am, my I'm contemporary uh, issues. To the greatest example is my book on Lima Barreto, where I revisit a very well researched writer, Francisco Assis uh, Barbosa, did a fundamental biography of Lima Barreto, but I revisit him based on the questions from my own time. What are the questions from my own context? The questions on civil rights. So it's civil the questions rights. on it is a question race. About Race, yeah, gender, gender, region. That's region. what I ask Lima Barreto. I go These where Francisco Assis Barbosa said. I'm not going to be talking about race, talk period. He said, that's where, where I, I visit. He and almost authorized me to do that. I think that in our tradition, presenting uh, social thinking, which is a kind of very male thinking Male, thus far at least now, very white, white and very european and very i always centric my so i always do mea my mea culpa. Culpa. we've, did that we've done together, this right? together and i gave a course on the history of brazilian thinking consisting only of men white european, european men there was only one black was no, who was lima bahia who had been studying for some time person. i think that this is so the this tradition is the here in brazil but when i in the book i try to bring up the issue of race for example in these three authors that i just quoted none of them deals with race. race. On the contrary, contrary they, they reinforce, reinforce the stigma. Brazilian patriarch patriarchalism and Caio Prado Jr. This is very evident, this reinforcement. So if we, if we pick up instance, that the, the design of Cicero Gias, the, painting uh, the, the sugar uh, mill, uh, sugar cane mill in Pernambuco, which is the opening to uh, Masters and Slaves. It's still in the current edition of Masters and Slaves. We have the scheme, the, scheme, the, the big house, house separate from the slave and quarters, the, slave the social place, you have the, the workplace, the children, the white children, white white children whipping the black beating, children. We don't talk about this. It's all there. The, all you have to do is open up the book, Masters and Slave. It's all right there. Enslaved it, people. The book so this is the book to, that we'll have. Uh, 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 use a tradition. essayist tradition. It is an it essay. Is an essay. Masters right. and slaves. And it is an essay. Also without essay footnotes. With only with no the, uh, references at the end. It's an, it's essay, an essay. Masters and slaves, which uh, returns to major themes of the history of Brazilian social thinking. But I believe that Masters and slaves, when it returns there, I try to do a double knot there. I try to find where the women are, even more than. And I history. did in Even Brazil in a bibliography, in Brazil, and I asked where BFF. race is and where why is it so is invisible it if it is so fundamental? Why is it, is where it so is the essential? issue of the invisible? regions, which is why an issue which 
is increasingly strong in the Brazilian history, the Northeast and Southeast, just to begin to focus on them increasingly. So I try to subvert this Brazilian social thinking and I try to expand it and amplify it because when I was giving my course, we our point of departure was this uh, a trilogy, you know, a social I mean, science social course, science all of us here, all of us, Flavia, know, Flavia knows about Lima, Flavia and Flavia Rios have studied social, social scientists, both social of them scientists. are social scientists. And we, we had, you know, the trilogy Holy Trinity of Weber, Marx, Marx and Engels and, and so forth, had the Holy Trilogy of the Essays, which were Gilberto Freire, Sergio Barca, Jolanda, and Caio Prado Jr. I try to expand the scope of that and have to amplify it even more. I believe that need to you know, we have uh, to really try, try to provoke to and change this perspective, perspective which at the end of the day is a perspective, which is, perspective is uh, that uh, except for Gilberto Freire, but it is quite it is uh, southeastern extinct. to provoke our debate here. It's very southeastern, it. southeastern Brazil, continuing on this trail of race and rights that you mentioned, and also on this path and this part of the provocation. In the book, you do an important discussion on persistent inequalities and you cite race, class, gender. And whenever you can, you go back to the phantom of slavery, even talking about late abolition and conservative abolition. When you develop these topics until the current days, you present a lot of numbers, statistics, a lot of indicators concerning the conditions in the black population and considering the policies for affirmative action policies. In this book, clearly, there is a defense of these affirmative action policies, a way of repairing social injustices and reparations and a powerful mechanism for inclusion. I was on page 37 here of your book, and you're very straight to the point in the term temporary policies to repair historical injustices and have a major impact on education and on inclusion of populations which were alienated from sc formal schooling for decades and centuries based on what you say in the book what you have done actually it is a question what made you change your idea concerning this subject since in the first decade of the 21st century this theme was heavily discussed as we know, generating public manifestos. And one of them was signed by you in opposition to quotas for black students. At the end of the day, what made you change your idea on affirmative action policies? I always like to answer this question. That's a great question. I think that social sciences are sciences, but we're based on trial and error. And I believe that all intellectuals who are honest with themselves have to have honesty to acknowledge when they've erred in this first stage of the manifestos on affirmative action. I was part of a group, an important group as well, which defended the idea of the existence of one single race, the human race, which therefore was meritocracy was embedded in that notion of universal rights and universal values. This was the time. Now, when I was reading Lelio Gonzalez, I see how backward I was. There were a lot of people talking about this already, but actually what made me change my understanding was the concept of social race. The idea that there are race, if we consider race as a biological concept, there's only one race, the human race. Nevertheless, even as an anthropologist, I learned that what society does is to uh, trick these concepts which sound so natural or seem so natural. So society produces difference and constructs difference and builds languages of difference in every research and study that I've done in my life, both on slavery and for example, with Lima Bajeto, they showed me the opposite, that it was necessary to deal with the concept of social race. Social race, what is it? It's the way that we build society which is absolutely unequal when i began to write my book flavia brazil was the 10th most unequal country in the world but when i ended it was the ninth most unequal and depending on the criterion in detail uh, land distribution it's the fifth most unequal country in the world since i studied this topic obviously there's not a meritocracy meritocracy in brazil i always give this example but it's a good example i part 
it's like a uh, hundred meter dash, but part of the Brazilian population begins at 50 meters. The other part of the population begins the 50 meter dash at the starting line and the rest of it begin at a hundred meters back. So there's no meritocracy in Brazil. There's no universal rights. If the point of departure, the starting point is such an unequal starting point uh, or starting line. I also believe that Brazilian society in general has a problem with policies for reparations. If we consider the issue, the military issue, for example, we have had a truth commission, but which did not have attributes. It could not try the cases. This was very bad for Brazil. You have to repair, make repercussions for families that lost parents, uh, brothers and sisters, children. You have to talk about reparations with relation to slavery as well and the black populations of Brazil. This because on the one hand, it's necessary to consider policies, distributive policies, for reparations and also symbolic policies. Franz Fanon calls attention when there is a double death, a dual death for black populations and they don't have, they die physically, but they also die in memory, the right to memory. We are living now in a situation, a paradoxical situation, considering the Palmares Foundation, where the main objective is precisely to remember to not forget the leading role of blacks in our in our society headed by a president of the foundation who just talked about a list of people who will not have their memory preserved because he can't trust what's going to happen from now on so we're talking about policies for reparations reparations material and symbolic reparations as well i change my views and i change and i defend quotas affirmative action quotas, which are uh, temporary measures. On the one hand, I defend them because it's necessary to have unequal measures to produce equality, but I defend based on a uh, propositional argument because I believe that m always is m always more. The more diverse we are, the better we will be. The population according to the Brazilian Census Bureau, black population corresponds to 56.1% of the entire Brazilian population, 56%. What do we do when we maintain policies for subordination for the majority of the Brazilian population? We are inhibiting our potential. So I also am in favor of and defend based on this perspective, which is uh, per propositional, it's propositional perspective. Okay, an assertive, position before we have questions from the audience would you like to react to that i would just like to comment very quickly that this dialogue which lillian mentioned concerning the issue of uh, symbolic policy it's interesting because it's precisely in this year of 2020 not only the large protests global protests against racism and black lives matter and public policies public security the issue of the death of black people here in brazil we called them properly a genocide of the black population, but there was also mobilization, a major mobilization in terms of memory and the spaces for memory. And it's interesting that they already have this issue concerning memory history and the text, which traverses the entire book. She called attention to Lelia Gonçalves. This is a central part of the thinking of Lelia Gonçalves, the idea of having the memory as this subjectivity it's transmitted uh, created and transmitted between generations so perhaps Lenin could come out on the monuments what this symbolizes the violence and the absence of a narrative concerning this kind of violence this symbolic violence it's a glorification of our tortures we're living in a country where we praise the tortures on the public squares and also at the in the executive branch what does it mean i believe that the symbolic beginning of Jair Bolsonaro is when in 2016, in the impeachment process for trial for uh, Juma Rousseff, he quoted when he voted Ustra, who was a torture, the prime torture in the military dictatorship. What's going to boil a lot of that? It's the uh, cauldron of democracy, because I think that, Flavia, what has happened at this stage. We see a lot of data from 2018 and 2019. It was the growth of this kind of intolerance, the greatest racial intolerance and then religious intolerance against the African descended religions and then gender and sex intolerance. So Brazilians have begun to enjoy displaying themselves as a turning 
a turnaround. And Brazilians began to enjoy uh, showing off as intolerant and hateful uh, these people using the title of the novel by Ruben Fonseca, the people that uh, are demanding their uh, needs, who it's the new agents are to blame. And it were full of streets and over underpasses with the name of tortures on the public and the names of the streets that are named after tortures. We have a number of monuments which reinforce and praise a certain historiography, very white and colonial, extremely colonial, our historiography. What does it mean, for example, that here we are, I'm gonna give you an example in Sao Paulo, but the two major post picture postcards for Sao Paulo are Borba Gato in Santa Mario, the huge statue and the monument to the uh, paddy rollers from the time of slavery in the front of the park near the state assembly. So it unveils the city. What are these two monuments? What do they represent? They are the result of Sao Paulo's historiography, which is very colonial and European, which created the figure of the paddy rollers as heroes and they uh, eliminated our frontier and explored the paddy rollers were hunting indigenous people and enslaved and fugitive slaves. And what they do these two monuments show, Borba Gato, it's, it's a phallic monument with this huge uh, rifle, the musket in this big uh, three corner hat. And the Petty Rollers monument in front of uh, the Portuguese, the only one riding on a horse, doesn't have to walk. The Portuguese behind him are indigenous people and carrying the weight are the African slaves, especially uh, African men and women. Of course, as you mentioned, the Brazilian publisher is uh, scornful and it play poke fun, either push or pull. It depends on the angle where you are. But what do we don't say when we don't talk about our monuments? They are supposedly neutral, supposedly neutral, but they end up uh, taking for granted perversions and they end up taking for granted narratives which are very committed to uh, backwardness uh, divide Brazilians into those who give the orders and those who by nature, quote unquote, obey. And that was a kind of, uh, there was a presentation at the monument to the piety rollers with indigenous symbols and everything. But I think that we need to inhabit our monuments and to tell other narratives, other stories, other histories, and in a sense, open up these spaces because we, and for us to reflect on these monuments and no longer believe that they are part of the landscape. It's a, a harmless landscape. There's nothing harmless about monuments to slave owners. I work a lot with images. We live in a kind of Brazilian civilization of images and the images are not just for illustrations purposes. They produce values, they produce realities, they produce ways of sociability. So I believe that the issue of the monument is an issue that is essential. It begins in the UK with Habsbaum, which in fact was presented as a Lord, the British, who was also, uh, it was presented as a slave owner, right? So these are the half truths, these narratives like Sir Walter Raleigh, she was mentioning, they have a lot of visibility that we need to, in a sense, uh, denounce them. Uh, questions from the audience, I attempt to condense and combine some questions because we're running out of time pretty soon. And the question is the following, how the period of the military dictatorship in Brazil and economic liberalism they link with the, this our authoritarianism in Brazil, the Brazilian authoritarianism. And if the 1988 constitution in a sense collaborated with that, and that's the question or contributed to it. The 1988 constitution was a constitution drafted within a certain context, a context of, it's not a coincidence that Ulysses Guimarães, the progressive, Congressman, he showed the Constitution say, with hate and rage at the military dictatorship. It's a robust Constitution. Great personalities and Brazilian 
society were called on to help draft. They didn't all participate equally. It was not the same use of the same drafting, but the 1988 constitution has, like all constitutions, has some aspects it was outdated in some aspects. It did not fail to deal with some issues. The issue of the one was the issue of the military dictatorship itself. So that this vision of this uh, sweet uh, sugar-coated uh, view of the military dictatorship as a time of health and financial stability, this sugar-coated view or interpretation, it's not an incorrect interpretation of what happened during the military dictatorship. We can recall the Trans-Amazonian Highway, the Trans-Amazonian Highway, which stole 10% of the Brazilian GDP and which was highly challenged. And we had the example, the case of Fleury, who was the Secretary of Public Security uh, representative, a corrupt representative. And we have the uh, bionic government governors who were representing spaces in this the time of corruption. Actually, what I mean to say here, to stop with the military dictatorship and go back to the issue of the 1988 constitution, the military dictatorship was uh, exalted by the current government, but it was a very time that was ripe with corruption and a lot of problems and it delivered Brazil over to with huge inflation at the end of the military dictatorship. Our 1988 constitution was re reacting to the military dictatorship. There was kind of a, a agreement under the table with the military and they awarded the military, but they cannot be tried. History can condemn them. History can say that they be thrown into the garbage bin of history, but they can't be actually tried and convicted. This has to do with the 1988 constitution. I don't know if economic liberalism came directly out of the 1988 constitution or it has more to do with the time that we are living in with this context that we are experiencing now this idea of the minimal state, this idea of minimal intervention and freedom, the market reign. Economic liberalism was heavily challenged in our pandemic context. If we think what the pandemic did with us is that meant that the governments were forced to intervene in their states and it forced the governments to, the presidents were forced to implement they needed to care for education when I talk about security and our health uh, per se. In Brazil, apparently one of the major heroes of the pandemic is the unified health system, the SUS, all the models for privatization of the SUS have uh, t taken water. In Brazil now to defend human rights is to defend the unified health system. 75% of the Brazilian population are treated by the unified health system. The SUS, when we're talking here in December 2020, there were 170,000 deaths in Brazil. Thanks to the SUS, it's not more than 170,000 deaths. So we're experiencing a time of a turnaround in expectations with regard to economic liberalism, especially in these areas that where we need the strong state, uh, organic state and uh, with rights and proposals and not a denialist state like our current uh, administration. Lillian, I want to thank you for this dialogue. And Flavia, I want to ask you if you have anything, final remarks, and Lillian as well, but very quickly because our time truly has run out already. So please, short and sweet. I'm going to conclude. Actually, I'm not going to ask anything. You can, uh, you can relax now. Go ahead, relax. I'm going to tell a quick story here in my struggle. I, when I read Lillian's book for this debate and this discussion concerning the place of slavery and the importance of slavery and the discussion concerning the history, especially an official history or the official history written by historians and the discussion on memory, it reminded me the first time that I believe that I remember in my memory that I saw the word slavery was in actually it was in a wake of my great grandfather and his daughter. It was about, I was about five years old saying that, that my great grandfather was, was a very bad person and he was very bad because he had been born in slavery. So it's interesting, but I've heard the word slavery before I uh, enrolled in school. I have a memory the first time that spoken 
story, the spoken history, the oral history by my grandparents and great grandparents. So the theme of slavery, it doesn't explain the way the book it doesn't explain all of our ills. We have a lot more ills to study and these ills, but in fact, this force of slavery, it is extremely important in the spin-offs and developments of Brazilian e political, economic, and cultural history. Thank you very much, Lillian. Thank you very much, Flavia, for your partnership. And thank you, Flip, for the invitation. Can I just say something very quickly? I want to thank, thank you all, the two Flavias. I was really happy we're here in a round table of women, which I think is extremely important in this round table of women. The two women are black and who have an extremely important role in this debate. Uh, important leadership role. It's no coincidence that black feminisms have given us a lesson and rewritten the story and refounded the history and have told another narrative and another history. And I am totally convinced and I've always have been that we will not have a democracy in Brazil as the black movement say, as long as black uh, Brazil is a racist as it is. It's not just an issue, a moral issue. It's doesn't do any good to blame one sector, the police or public security. I believe that it's much more that we need to do what MEC, the, the rapper said, he was quoted that MEC, the, the rapper has said that we're going to have to come first. So I hope that we are able at some stage of our history to reach in first place with racism and overcome it. Okay, fine. I want to thank you for participating. It's a huge pleasure to be here with both of you. Lily and Flavia, I want to thank Flip, and we're adjourning this round table. We're adjourning with a quote that Lillian quotes in her book on Lima Bajeto, the Brazilian authors. Are, we Brazilians are like Robinson Crusoe's. We're always waiting for the ship to come from the deserted island uh, where the shipwreck has cast us away. Good afternoon.